Well, notice I went somewhere different today to proclaim the gospel. Does anyone know what that center of the labyrinth is called? Five pair, uh, syllables to that in. Illumination. That central part of the labyrinth is called the illumination. And because I'll be talking about that in just a few paragraphs in this sermon, I thought I would start there with the gospel. Hoping that that gospel, that good news story would illuminate all of us today. We gather on this Sunday celebrating the three kings and the baptism of our Lord. That's a lot to pack into one Sunday. Each year from Christmas in December all the way to Easter, which is usually in April, we take time to notice and celebrate that God came to live in human form among us. It's called an incarnational part of our liturgical calendar from Christmas to Easter, from the birth of that human form in Bethlehem to the death on Calvary, and then the resurrection in that garden. We focus during this incarnational portion of each year on the enormity of God's love. The enormity of God's love for all of humanity and for all of creation. And we focus together on God being revealed to us specifically in Jesus as the Messiah, in human form. As we listen over the next several Sundays, and we started this in Christmas, to stories of Jesus being revealed to us as the Messiah, we notice that there's not a formula to it, that Jesus is revealed in varied ways, in diverse ways, to vary and diverse peoples. Those shepherds, they were just at work that day when angels came to them. That's quite a revelation. It's not always how it is. Now, the wise ones today, as we celebrate the story of the wise ones finding Jesus, which was no easy task, they travel from a long way off. They are in a totally different nation, country miles away, and they make the decision to go and seek Jesus. That's really different from the shepherds. So as we listen to these stories, listen to the different ways in the several weeks we have ahead of us, the different ways that Jesus reveals God to people. Those wise people set out to meet Jesus because of an ancient foretelling, a sign that they noticed and they understood because of their studies, they understood that sign to point to the birth of a king in Israel. So they traveled for many, many miles, for many, many days, I assume, maybe many, many weeks or months. Certainly, they faced some travel discomforts, right? Have you ever been on a trip where there wasn't a little discomfort? I mean, even in my lovely, beautiful, with heated seats, you still get a little stiff after a long drive. Imagine doing it on a camel, not a human species, I don't think, uh, a camel and those rocky roads and not having gas stations and convenience stores and places where you can just quickly grab a room or search on your phone for a room. They certainly face some discomforts along the way. They probably also had some exciting adventures that were really surprising and interesting. And I'm going to guess that they learned more about each other as they travel together. Isn't that always true? When you travel with someone, your companion, you learn things about them, sometimes good, sometimes not so good, right? So they would have had some adventures together. They would have been surprised. They would have new experiences, even as they made sacrifices and gave some things up to take the trip. They would have been gifted with new experiences and adventures. And finally, after all of that, they arrive in Jerusalem. It's not quite where that child Jesus is, but they arrive in Jerusalem because it's got a temple, and it's got a fancy palace for a king, and they are there to meet a new king. It must be Jerusalem. 
So they go to the person in power, his name is Pink Herod, and basically, friends, this is not rude to say, I promise, he's a joke of a king. It's just true. He's not a good king. He's so selfish and motivated by his own interests and desires that he doesn't take care of the people he's responsible to govern. And so he's a bit of a joke to people. Even his own people just try to stay out of his way. Nobody expects much from King Herod. But these foreign folks, they don't know that. They show up on his doorstep at the palace and say, show us the new king. And Herod says, new king? What new king? And he, in great fear and manipulation, goes and consults the king and finds out some things. And as the wise ones interact with King Herod, they understand through dreams and their own awareness that they are meant to distrust King Herod. They are not meant to return to Herod and help Herod find this new king. They are meant to avert their path from the path of King Herod. This king who utilized power for his own desire rather than to govern his people with care and wisdom. There's a lesson in that for us. The wise people departed from King Herod's court in Jerusalem. They went a bit farther out into the hinterlands, if you will, away from the seat of power to the outskirts, to the edges, to find Jesus. This king was not to be found at the center of earthly power. This king Jesus is to be found at the edges. That's a lesson for us, too. The wise people went far, physically speaking, to find this King Jesus. And they went far emotionally and intellectually speaking to travel beyond their expectations of what they would find, beyond their assumptions of earthly ways of power being manifested in the world. How far, my friends, how far will we go to meet Jesus? How far? How far will I go? Am I willing to make those sacrifices, to have those new adventures? How far will I go? How far will you go to meet Jesus? Like the wise ones, we are called to seek out signs that point us to Christ, to the King who was born in order to teach us a different way to govern our own hearts and lives, to be governed by the love and goodness of God alone. Like the wise ones, we are called to work our way toward Christ by going beyond our selfish desires, by going around those selfish desires operating around us and even within us. Like the wise ones, we have a choice to make. Will we go or not? Will we go a little farther or not? Will we trust in this kind of power or not? We have choices to make. Will we sacrifice the comforts of our lives to take this trip into an unknown space in order to meet Jesus? Will we? Will we remain open to engaging in these adventures along the way with fellow travelers? Get to know each other better? Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to engage with others who travel alongside us to meet Jesus? How far exactly will we go? How far beyond our expectations and assumptions are we willing to go? How far will we go to meet Jesus? Throughout the history of Christianity, time and time again, God's people have said, I'm willing to go pretty far. <laughs> God's people, we often call them saints, sometimes we call them pilgrims, faithful people, a great cloud of witnesses. God's people throughout the ages have said, I am willing to go really far to meet Jesus. What's more important than that anyway, right? People have made the choice to get on their camel, their horse, or their own two feet, sometimes even being carried or going on their knees to travel as a pilgrim to the Holy Land, to find Jesus. They still, we still look for Jesus in Bethlehem in Jerusalem. I have a friend who got on a plane yesterday to the Holy Land. We had 
intentions as a congregation of going to the Holy Land in April of 2020, we still will go so far and make sacrifices to seek out those places where we need Jesus. When we travel to these Holy Land places, when we're able to do that, that's lovely. Sometimes things get in the way, as we've learned in this congregation. And throughout the millennia, Christians have not always been able to afford the trip or be healthy enough to make the trip. And so they have found places close to the home, shrines and holy spots and holy wells and springs where they can be in the presence of Christ with other companions along the way. They go to places like to see the Black Madonna in Bavaria or in Mexico City to the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe. They go to Assisi, they go to Rome, they go to Santiago de Compostela, they go to Canterbury. They go all over to find Jesus. And when travel to some of these locations is too far, many pilgrims make a journey in a really different way. They choose to make a trip to something just like this labyrinth. In fact, some pilgrims come to this very room, to this very floor, to walk this very labyrinth to meet Jesus. How many people have walked a labyrinth before? Wonderful, because we have one right here. So if you didn't put your hand up, we have to move the chairs out of the way. That's a little bit of a barrier, but that's part of the experience, right? Part of the sacrifice. So I'm going to show you something that happens when we walk the labyrinth, because if you haven't done that before, you may not know. This beautiful geometric experience on the floor of the parish house it begins right here, and it also ends right here in the same spot. You can't get lost. When you go in, you can't take the wrong turn. You only take the turn that's in front of you. And when I set off, I stand here for a while until I feel ready. Sometimes that takes a long time to feel ready, right? Ready for the journey. And sometimes I walk this labyrinth, and I open my hands up. Can everybody open their hands up? A nice, soft, gentle opening. And in this gesture, what I'm saying with my body is, God, take from me whatever is loading me down so that I can walk this walk. Remove from me any sort of grudge or resentment, any burden, any anxiety that's going to be a roadblock on this journey. Lift it from me. Let me walk lightly this walk. And sometimes I walk this, and we're going to fast forward, and I get to this spot, to this spot, and I have to stand at this spot and wait because I'm still more like this than like this in my heart. I'm holding on to something, and I'm not ready to enter the, the illumination. I'm still holding on to something with a death grip, and I need to stand here and really open not only my hands, but my whole life to God. Easier said than done. And when I feel like I've worked it that long enough, or not worked it that long enough, sometimes the release is in the not working, I come into the illumination, and I usually sit right here. I don't know why, but I usually sit in this spot, on the floor, crisscross applesauce with my hands on my knees, and I wait, and I wait, and I wait for clarity, for some assurance of the presence of God, for some knowledge that the presence of Christ is leading me on. And when I feel ready, I get up and I turn and I walk back out of this labyrinth. And my hands again are open, but this time I'm not saying take, I'm saying give. Give God, give me what I need for this journey. I'm sending back out there into the world from this holy space. What do I need? Do I need courage? Do I need hope? Do I need joy? Do I need confidence? What do I need? And then I come to the end, fast forward, step, you never really step over those lines. <laughs> and when I get back here, I stand at this end, and before I step out, I say thank you to God. Because in the process, I will have met Christ again. I will know Christ in a new and different way. It always works. Why does it always work? 
Because when we say, I want to meet you, Jesus, Jesus never, ever lets us down. Jesus is always present. We don't have to get on an airplane and go to Jerusalem or Bethlehem. We do not have to leave home and even come to the parish hall that way. We can sit in our most comfortable armchair with our hands open and take time to make the sacrifices, the releasing work that we are called to do so that we can find Jesus. And then we can receive whatever God is giving to us, whatever illumination will light up our life and our journey. And then we can just let God fill us with all the goodness that God has in mind for us. Throughout the ages, God's people have created long lists of ways to do this, whether you're at home in your iron chair or you're coming to church. Some of those Christian practices require the letting go act of entering the labyrinth. Some require the sitting in silence and being, and some require the receiving. Some of those practices are fasting, prayer, silence, frugality, so that we can be truly generous with others. Those can be sacrifices of time and energy. And then some Christian practices are fellowship and celebration, gathering for worship with music, serving people with our bodies. Here's the thing. We can choose to go far to meet Jesus and never leave home and find Jesus right there with us where we are. If we open ourselves, when we open ourselves to these kinds of practices, these kinds of disciplines that govern our hearts and minds and open us to the love and goodness of God. These are tried and true. When we do these practices, when we walk the labyrinth, make a pilgrimage, have practices around service or justice and advocacy, because taking a stand against King Herod is a spiritual practice too, by the way. When we engage in these spiritual practices, what we will find when we are willing to go so far to meet Jesus is that more and more we become Christ to others who are also looking for Jesus. So by engaging in Christian practices, by searching and seeking out Christ, we become signs pointing to Christ. We become ways that reflect, that illuminate the world for Christ. Amen. Amen.